you will shoot the gun more if you like the trigger. You will shoot the gun more if you have a decent stock and a decent handguard, right? And so kind of go through the things that make the shooting experience what it is, as opposed to measuring groups downrange if, if they don't care about groups downrange. All right, what is up, everybody? Got Jimmy to my right. Across from us, we have Zach. Br- Wait, no, not Zach Brown. That's Adam, and we have I do not sing. Ruben, and we got we got some AR experts here. And what we're going to talk about today is building an AR. So I know from firsthand experience, this is a process that can literally take years. First, you got to get a bunch of parts. And then, yeah, and sometimes the only part you're missing, quote, is a roll pin. One roll pin. And you got to, yeah. from my knowledge, one of, single roll pin of your experience, you have to let them cure at your desk for two years. You got to let them cure for at least two years. Yeah, now, like marinating and like process. Jim, like Jim alluded to, you're going to, you might find out that you need a couple things to complete it. You, you forgot a couple things. There's two years right there. And then probably uh, tack onto that two years of just uh, sheer procrastination. And you're where we're at right now. Are we at five? Is it five years total? I to think build we, an AR? I think we're at six. Six. Nailed six it. ish. You know, that's going to be that's uh, going to no, be you your sold, ballpark. You sold your other one in 2014, so like end of 2014. So yeah, that is yeah. So we're at about, six. Yeah, yeah, it's about six, six years. Six According now, and almost 2021. If you're watching right now, you're literally you, you can see a basket of AR parts. It's it's a wicker basket. It's lined with some sort of plaid fabric. It's very nice. It's where a lot of people store their AR parts and a cardboard box. Uh full of other AR parts. Jim, I'm going to let you guys take it from here because I've, I've provided all my expert advice. And then <laughs> uh, really what I'll do now, from now on, is just listen to what you guys say. Wait, you're taking credit for this? I've made this list for you. Time out. Time out. You're responsible for this, Ruben? Ruben? At least Ruben? one of the lists. Ruben? This Ruben? box. It's well done. Ru- Ruben's got a, a nice... I feel like there's a few other rogue additions. items in here that Mark just added to cart by himself. <laughs> there's, 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 <laughs> there's, there's some rogue items in here. And I think you guys will be like really excited about them. But well, here, here's what I'm are. saying, though. From here on, I provided my expert uh, you know, uh, advice, and then I'm going to listen to you guys on really uh, talking about these things and also how to put one of these darn things together. Yeah. You're, yeah. You're our token friend that we made buy all this stuff so that we could build an AR. Exactly. We and didn't, didn't want functions. to do it ourselves, but we wanted to put it together. Can we just so. say friend? Can we just say and just probably the word friend? Token friend. So, okay, He's Ruben Washington. and Adam, you guys you it's guys for the audience. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have used, built, shot, all that stuff, and and bought even factory built ones. ARs a ton. I know I've done the same thing as well myself, just not nearly to the capacity that you guys have. And I think that when it comes to building an AR, there can be a, uh, which again, we're going to talk to specifically, but I think we can also reference, you know, when you're building something, how it'll compare to a factory built gun. But there are um, just so many options out there. AR-15s, they're like they're like the Jeep Wrangler of the gun industry, which there's my car reference. Uh, sorry. One of them. Got yeah, it in know, early. Of, yeah, got it in early. Boom, but there's it. countless accessories out there. There's countless options. Companies with various different, you know, um, things that they market as being better at X versus X, you know, something else that's better at Y. Um, and so it's hard to know exactly what to pick. Um, I know usually I myself end up trying to build something weird that nobody else has built before. So I've got experience with a lot of the like random goodies and odds and ends. Um, most of it's all still in pieces just because I'm always switching it around. But um, just a fairly large portion of the AR market. Yes, exactly. Um, so anyway, where do you guys, let's say, again, you're building one. Mm-hmm. I know that uh, obviously when I say, where do you start? You're going to say, well, it depends on what you're going to use it for. Am I right? You're probably gonna have I, to. Oh, I could. I could start. Talk about a use case first that you're gonna be. Uh, well, where does it start? At the very beginning, I would say it starts with a receiver. That's fair. And that's not a. It depends. I feel like most of the receivers start in the same place, no matter where you're gonna yeah. go with it. But like, okay, so with a lower receiver, that's mm-hmm. the thing. That's the serialized item. That's the thing mm-hmm. you gotta go to the FFL for. You can't just have it shipped to your doorstep. Everything yep. else, you can. Pretty much, yep. Pr- pretty much from, yeah, I guess unless I'm forgetting something. But anyway, that 
in and of itself, though, there's a ton of different options within lower receivers. Like you oh, can get yeah. a regular forge lower, which is as basic as basic gets, or you can get these super fancy multiple hundred dollars billet receivers with all their ambidextrous whatnots and yep. you know. Correct. So what how do you even begin there? Well, I think uh some of it I would say is price point. You know, some some lowers are more economical than others. Um I would I would I guess I would boil it down to uh, do you want or need ambidextrous controls? Yes, no. That'll narrow down quite a few. It'll cut cut it in half for you one way or the other. What's your opinion on that? I'm left-handed, so I, I like ambidextrous okay. uh, lowers. Okay. So I'm, if I don't get an ambidextrous lower, I'm going to invest one to $200 in buying ambidextrous parts to swap out. Like a lot of A lot of guns that I've gotten in the past, I mean, right off the bat, the selectors, the ambi cat, the mag catch, and the charging handle, just like right into the trade fodder pile. Um, if if you're not left-handed, is it a concern, or why would a person think, maybe gravitate towards or away from that? Like, oh, I I, I need know, that, or I don't need that. The ambidextrous lowers are actually yeah, more they're actually more uh, appealing, I think, to right-handed shooters because they all the now they basically have the bolt catch. Where you could hit it with your trigger finger, your index finger, okay. instead of needing to thumb push it. Oh, usually on it's the just a bolt. Yeah. Do they are they are they most of them becoming bolt catches now as well, or a lot of them for They've a while evolved. there were like mm-hmm. just bolt releases and it couldn't actually catch the bolt. Yep. You still had to hit the ADM, bottom side of that. Yeah, there is like yep. one or two that have a catch. Okay. Yep. Uh, ADM, Radian, LMT. They've they've innovated ways that you can catch and release. Okay. With with your it would be your right, fi- right, your trigger finger, right, basically, and that's an evolution from five years ago. That was pretty, pretty rare. I practice catch and release. So there you go. <laughs> and then, um, so ambidextrous ness, and then, um, do you want a forged or a billet receiver? Billet receiver, essentially, you're getting into stylization. They're able to mill out cool styles. They tend to have more flared mag wells and things like that. Right. Integrated trigger guard. Integrated trigger uh, guards. <laughs> There's some, there's some, I guess, some that are more beefed up and some that are more lightened. Yep. Yeah. Forging, okay. forging is the mill spec. That's the original. It is actually lighter. It is actually stronger. Uh, and there are some stylized versions of them now, but it's really, it's really a taste preference. You know. You do have to start out with a forging. I mean, that's a, it. It's a downside to making an upper or a lower. Because the forgings can be hard to get, depending on demand. Mm-hmm. So if you're making a billet lower or a billet upper, you get a block of aluminum. If you're make, making it from a forging, you have to get that from a place that does that. Mm-hmm. So in times of high demand, you might notice that there will be billet receiver sets available, whereas companies making forged rifles aren't mm-hmm. are having problems with and usually, like the cheaper stuff that works and functions goes pretty quick in those high times of demand as well. Where yeah. It's like oh yeah. Yeah, and stuff. I wouldn't confuse. Oh, yeah. There's a couple things too on forged receivers that I wouldn't confuse. Um, I think quality versus quality control are two different things because yes. you can get a very high quality part that one of the holes is misaligned. It doesn't mean it's a hmm. bad part. It just means that the quality control wasn't there. So that's sometimes where the cost comes in on a, if you were looking at strictly a f- one forged receiver set versus another forged receiver set. And there's a few really, you know, what you would call like a budget brand. There's a few names out there that are really synonymous with being that lower dollar. Yeah. And then there's some brands that are synonymous with being a premium brand. And I think one of the main differences is probably quality control during machining. Yeah. Because I always roll the dice with the cheapest I've stuff. N- yeah, and I've <laughs> never, just this is just my personal sample set, but I've never broken a receiver, like yeah. a forged receiver, the lower because it was lower dollar. Stress. No, it doesn't. It's not a um, rare part. No, for sure. Okay. Yeah, I like when I first started out. I remember that like I thought it was I thought the billet receivers were really cool, and they are. They they're are definitely yes. super awesome, and there are advantages to them. That was probably my first two receivers, and then after a while, I was like, okay, that hurts the wallet a little bit, and I can still build ARs off this forge lower. And really, as long as I just practice with it enough, it won't be a huge detriment for what I tend to use it for. Mm-hmm. But 
like get back to your original question though for me for me a project usually starts with a lower in in my world it's usually something i pull off a prize table i end up with a lower it's like hmm this could sit on my shelf or i can make it into something and usually the ride home is long enough that we could come up with some sort of concoction that this could turn into for so usually it starts with a receiver and it goes from there. It really yeah. is amazing because you look at that kind of singular piece right there, that, which is it's like, not like much. Your, it's not much, but it's like this baseline, and then just it's like kind of um, whatever your wildest dreams. You know, you mm-hmm. can build anything around it that you want. It yeah, that is that within is very cer- true. Yeah, within certain confines, you can kind of do whatever you want. And I think the people that have the most problems with built ARs are probably ones that tried to do something that's never been done or they're thinking so far outside the box not not pointed at you jim but oh, um please no, i looked at you i guess it's mark late. looked right at me um, it's all right there's kind of certain when you look at a built rifle versus a rifle that you build so buying one from a manufacturer that's put together adam and i talk about this all the time there's talked certain things we talked about it yesterday there's certain things that manufacturers who are building a rifle and then testing that before they ship it out to a customer they're finding out things during that testing process, like, you know, the gas journal diameter or gas uh, port diameter. They're finding out things like spring rates and what types of springs they use and buffer weights, um, what things don't work well together. I mean, there's just certain things with tolerance stacking on from one brand to the next that mm-hmm. it just might not be advantageous to build those parts together. So that's really what you're getting when you go with a built gun versus a gun that you build. They always... Uh, Every time I've t- I've handled a factory built rifle that's even like even mid tier, it always feels better than the one that I hobbled together. And that there's certain things that they do though during that build process. Yeah. I mean, and they uh, build I know, thousands of yeah, them. Yeah, I know manufacturers that I know manufacturers that um, take and polish the inside of the buffer tube. Um, that'll polish you know guide rails or places where the bolt carrier makes contact, or they'll um, they have procedures for double checking their their carrier tolerances. Um, even after, even between you just ordering it on their website and them taking it out of a box and putting it into a gun, they have processes and procedures that they're doing to get rid of some of those inconsistencies and just really refine that gun so that right. when you get it in your hand, you're like, huh, this, there's something about this. And it's like, maybe it's the wiggle in the receiver. They had the option to go out in their warehouse and take an upper and a lower and try di- 10 different uppers with that lower until they found one that was really tight. Yeah, mm. And they, they may or may not, but like you buying one, you bought this one and then you bought an upper and you put them together and that's, that's what your gun's going to be where them, yeah. they have, you know, a bin full of them. They might, they might on this one just be like, let's try a different one. Yeah. Well, that one fits better. Just, you know, stacking tolerances. Okay, mm-hmm. that's what goes down the line. You know, where when you like buy when you buy one of each, you're that's kind yeah. of committed. Yeah. You've kind of got a lot yeah. of different variables at play or mm-hmm. kind of some unknowns. And I, and I imagine, again, you guys know a lot more about this than I do, but, you know, they've uh, in some ways, like, they've got a, a specific model, right? So they've yep. kind of perfected that process. I think to a high degree, they probably know what parts go together and why they're going together and, and all those different things where I've got a lot of b- a bunch of cool stuff here, but when it all goes together, is it going to work like super optimally? M- maybe there's a couple question marks there. I mm-hmm. Yeah, you can you can take an order a seven and a half inch barrel. Let's just say you're going to build an AR pistol with, you know, with a brace on it and you're you got a seven and a half inch five five six barrel, and you you're like, you know what? What kind of muzzle device should I put on? So you're clicking through the options on Brownells or Midway, and you're like, oh, well that one's half twenty eight threads. I'll order that one. Looks cool. It looks cool, and you get it. And let's just say the back pressure was you know optimized for some different barrel length, or it's a break, and now you thread it on the gun, and you have a four foot fireball every time you shoot. Like there are things that I think builders maybe just know through experience having mm-hmm. done it with a bunch of different parts and a bunch of different options that they might be like, Ooh, we don't want to put that on that gun because that's just really not pleasant to shoot. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's, that's kind of what you, you, although building is a ton of fun, that's one of the things that's just an inherent risk of building your own AR is that there might be combinations that yes, while they fit together, while they're compatible, technically, if you have the wrong buffer weight or you have the wrong, you know, uh, buffer tube size, you might not have the greatest experience. Yeah. 
Do you guys, we talked a little bit about the lower receiver. Now there is an upper receiver that then connects into that. And, uh, and that is, how do you guys feel about that? That's another thing that you can go as simple as you want with a forging. Or again, there are billet ones and you can get a billet one that then matches your lower and it looks Mm -hmm. really cool and stylized nicely. You can get them with slick sides and no, uh, forward assist. You can get them, you know, with, uh, Mark, is there a side charger over there? Is that what I saw? Kind uh, of. What is, yes. that? what is that upper? That's something you didn't tell us about. Yeah, Mark's been. That hold- was my surprise for you. For me, for doing for like Christmas. Christmas. Well, no, I mean, but I thought you guys uh, would be this, surprised. This by basket that. is more exciting than my Christmas was. I'll tell you that. Anyway, but there's all kinds of different upper options. You can so yeah. is that also kind of oh like dear. a? And that's oh another God. risk. Oh you can have things just fly out at you. <laughs> is that also something that's kind of like uh, like the lower, though? The upper doesn't seem to be a huge wear item. I mean, it does experience probably more than the lower, perhaps, but, I mean, uh, is that something I, where you want to start yeah. spending some money, or is it another thing where... Uh, um, I haven't personally seen an upper, like, wear out within probably at least 40,000 rounds of hard use, and if you maintain and clean and properly lubricate... I don't think an upper could be really considered that much of a wear part. No. Mm. I mean, you're going to wear the finish off of yeah. it. Yeah. For sure. Like cosmetic, um, okay. Yeah. Um, but even like on the inside, like where the bearing surfaces are, that's going to shine up. But um, no, not really not really a wear part per se. That's kind of, yeah, like um, that's why, that's why, that's one of the reasons also, again, where it's kind of like I take a little bit more time and maybe we'll spend a little bit more money than some other folks on receivers because you're kind of committed for a while. We're like, on the other oh, hand, okay. on the other hand, a barrel is disposable. You, That's an you, interesting way of looking at it. You know, I, it took me a long time. Yeah, I think, I think it was Grand Thumb that actually like had that aha moment for me, but he's like, people will ask the question like, well, should I should shoot steel cased ammo through? It's going to wear out the, it's going to wear out my chamber. It's like your, your barrel's living on borrowed time. Anyway, mm-hmm. like and hmm. you may not get there, but like yeah, it is going to wear out. Unlike a receiver, sure, man. I because I was thinking that's actually a little bit of a, an epiphany, if you will, for me as well. Because I I was thinking the opposite because it's a receiver, it functions, it doesn't mm-hmm. have to be fancy. In yeah. my in my opinion, that's why I've usually when yeah. I, I'm getting like I'm literally getting the cheapest yeah. blem upper and lower forged whatever. Yeah. Hey, if it's a slick side, it's even cheaper. Sounds good buy forward assist, you know, like yeah. all that stuff. But then I'm thinking, well, if I get a really fancy barrel, then it'll be super accurate. It'll be super yeah. whatever. It'll be super accurate. And it may last longer than another barrel, but I mean, that that is something with the shelf life. Your bolt right. is something with a shelf life. Hmm. The Probably depending on the shooter, life. though. Like, for you guys, yeah, barrel, yeah. borrowed time, wear part. Probably for a lot of folks might be the only one they ever need. I Correct. think barrels, yeah, yeah, I think barrels can be overstated. Um, I think uh, the, in the competition world, you know, there's guys that replace the barrel every year. I think more often than not, they do it just because they're like, oh, I got to get a new barrel this year. It sounds you cool know? to say I replaced uh, my barrel. Oh, I replaced my barrel at 10,000 rounds. And it's like, well, the last barrel that I replaced um, and having pretty heavy shooting schedule, mm-hmm. um, I replaced it at about 34,000 rounds. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and it started to open up the groups. Um, you know, it, it was time for a new barrel, but uh, th- that's a lot of rounds in in you know in today's ammo cost, and and in even regular ammo cost, that's a considerable amount of time and money in shooting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I you think- might ask a guy like, "Oh, where are you at with that thing?" You might go, "Oh, dude, thirty-four. and be like, "Oh, dude, thirty-four thousand? No, thirty-four. 34 yeah. rounds. <laughs> well, I think I think the point- one magazine plus like I had I some leftovers. leftovers. I found them in the door. I think the point that they were making when I heard that, the point that he was making is like, so if you're shooting a lower grade ammunition and the worry is, well, it's going to cause excessive wear on my parts. Well, if you're saving 10 cents a round over the lifespan of that barrel, that 20,000 rounds, you could buy another barrel and then some with what you were saving okay. ammunition Yeah, is what they were saying. You know, yeah. so, so if you're pricing yourself out of your shooting budget by buying premium parts... You know, you could you could say you know it was it was a cost savings thing. It's like realistically, you know, over right. the lifespan of a barrel, you could buy another barrel for what you were, or vice versa. You know? I will say this though. I will say this about 
kind of the way I look at parts that you interact with versus parts that you might not interact with as much. Um, it all goes into the shooting experience. It's all part of the gun. Obviously, it's all part of the gun functioning. But in the way that Jim talked about receiver sets, I have similar, uh, kind of similar feelings about that. Like, I don't interact with the receiver as much as I interact with the handguard yeah. or my grip or the trigger. So if somebody is building a, a, a rifle and let's just say they're like, hey, I'm building a gun, I wanna, want your opinion on parts, I'll usually tell them, like, you know, ask a few questions, you know, how much you plan to shoot it, what do you want to do with it? Um, and again, you can go down that rabbit hole of millions of different possibilities um, of what you can use it for. But a lot of the times if they're going to say, well, I want to, I, here's my budget, and I'll say, okay, well, you're not going to be shooting it enough to realize the difference between a $200 barrel and a $1,000 barrel. Hmm. So let's focus on some other things, though. You will shoot the gun more if you like the trigger. You will shoot the gun more if you have a decent stock and a decent handguard, right? And so kind of go through the things that make the shooting experience what it is as opposed to measuring groups downrange if if they don't care about groups downrange. Yeah. Right. You know, I'm shooting it off of my gator at coyotes at 100 yards and under. Don't need a half-minute gun for that. So let's not spend $700 on a barrel. You can, but if we're dealing with a budget, it's not necessary. Are you ready for the flame show you're about to receive for saying that you don't need a half-minute gun for that? Sure. Sure. Send it. <laughs> yeah, send it. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think... I don't know. Ruben, <laughs> Ruben would probably agree with this too. Like when you want to start talking about parts and stuff, the stuff we're probably the most opinionated about are the touch points. Yeah. Hmm. Um, even between, you know, even like internally on our shooting team, you know, we all kind of do the same stuff. We go to the same places. We all have different opinions on which pistol grip we use. Sure. You could probably tell whose gun's whose by what pistol grip's on it. There's a lot of different there's a lot of different choices in there. I know that's something that I've never and and you get into a little bit of what you alluded to earlier Adam, which is where a lot of times you go out you buy part, you buy stuff and then you get it and you're like, "Man, I have a financial investment in this." Oftentimes you have to mount it to the gun in order to figure out whether you like it or not, which yes. at that point you can't mm-hmm. really return it anymore most of the time. Yep. And uh, so you've done that, you're committed, and then if you t- end up not liking it, now you're sort of like, oh, "Shoot." Do I go and spend more money and get another thing that I still don't know if I'm going to like, or do I just make myself like this or, or sort of just get by with it? Like grips. You know, yeah. I have, I've got all kinds of Magpul grips, all kinds of whatever else, Ergo grips. I've got, you know, who knows, name every brand I've got grips, and they're all laying around waiting to grow into other ARs probably, but it's just... Well, I guess my answer to that question would be, did you, did you buy it as a model? Like, is it from a reputable manufacturer, like you bought, like you bought X brands, a model. Okay. That's, that's, you know, or did you piece something together or is a highly modified something or other? If it's a model, it has secondary resale value. Mm -hmm. Sure. So if you bought, if you bought, you know, a Daniel Defense and for whatever reason, it just wasn't your thing. You can sell that at a, at a gun shop. And they'll, you know, and recover some of your costs. Mm-hmm. If you build something, you're kind of committed at that point. Yeah. Or if you take something and you're trying to make it into something it's not, that's where you're kind of throwing good money after bad. Like, especially mm-hmm. in times like this where guys are grabbing at any AR they can get. I, I had a neighbor after like the whole Sandy Hook thing. He, he, he paid $1,500 for a $500 uh, rifle. He's not going to listen to this show, so it's okay. Um, but <laughs> did you tell? He's did, not that. Is guy. this something you didn't break the news? <laughs> you know, to Adam, him, or was he to, aware of it? But he tried to turn if it he's into not a three thousand dollars. Does that rifle? mean you're not recommending the Vortex Nation podcast to your friends? He's just not that oh, guy. My gosh, okay. I didn't look that deep into it. He's again. he's a boomer. Well, I did. He doesn't do podcasts. You know, um, <laughs> oh, boomers. Jeez, boy, Adam, man, Zach Brown over there. My <laughs> gosh. <laughs> Sorry, Mark, um, but <laughs> other Mark. His name's also Mark. Um, but he tried to turn it into a three thousand dollar three gun rifle. Mm. It's like, but he started off with a gun that had a mil spec stock, a not so awesome barrel for what he was trying to do. He needed to change the muzzle device, he needed to change the handguard. So he took fifteen hundred dollar investment and tried to make it into something it was not. Don't go that route. If you buy a model and it's not too different, 
it has secondary value. Builds generally don't. Our local gun store, one of our local gun stores here, they they won't they won't sell it if it's a build. Yeah, really. When I worked in retail, I mean, they, we would consign them if you want. Okay. But if it's a build, it's kind of a it's cool to one person, and we're waiting for that other person who it's also cool to. But those are few and far between when there's you know Baskin Robbins. When- Right. Plus, as a Flavors. gun store, if you sell it to somebody and then it doesn't work and they come back to the gun store like, hey, figure out why this doesn't yeah. work. They're like, well, I didn't build it and, and nobody built it except for one dude in his basement. Mm-hmm. So right. I don't mm-hmm. know what to tell you. Yeah, yeah. I'd be curious if there's even like a liability thing there. There is. That's why they don't touch a lot of it. Okay. But, but to answer your question, so like, you know, would, would I change something about a gun if it was a model and you could throw a grip at it? Sure. I mean, most of the guns that we buy as like fully assembled rifles, yeah, if especially even even for um for guns we use for work, if it's one that I'm going to spend a lot of time with, I'm probably going to put the grip on it that and, I like and a trigger. Yeah. And a trigger, you know. Well, and those are yeah. some of those finer touch points that you're talking about that right. yeah. like like you guys are going to be able to tell that, right? Yeah. Like I'd have to shoot a lot to be like, oh, I like this one a little bit more than that See, one. See, the, the trigger is like you can tell. The trigger is one of those things. Where well, I not can... the trigger because actually, in my old AR, the one that I sold a long time ago, the only thing that I did replace on it was the trigger. Yep. But even wow. I, I what a, my point is, I did customize it. Which it. which trigger doesn't really matter? It's kind of I'm kind of at the point where it's like there's triggers that are not awesome, and then there's triggers that are pretty good. And as yeah. long as it's pretty good, sweet. If it's like got a lot of mil spec creep in it, and you know it's pretty heavy and gritty, Feels like there's I'm gonna get rid of that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what this AR had. Yeah, but as and far it was as like horrendous, yeah. I was like, no, this has to go. If like, it's if it's just like, oh no, bro, I only I only shoot brand C two stage triggers, and that's all I do. Well, cool. If it, but like, it's not a deal breaker for me if if it doesn't have the trigger in it. I just want a better one mm. than the military decided they needed in 1955. You know? <laughs> That's fair. Hey, I mean, changed. Hey, back then they were just trying to upgrade from, uh, you know, yeah, they're, what, the yeah, they were just trying something. to put rifles in the hands of draftees, you know, we're, yeah. we're beyond that. So. so, all right, but we're kind of talking about stuff that's in and around the receivers. So we got, mm-hmm. you know, grips and stuff. And again, we're, we're talking mostly to like building. So yep. like yep. from, from scratch, from parts. Mm-hmm. Um, now you guys said, obviously the grip is one of those personal opinion things. Mm -hmm. I know that there are grips that are real straight up and down, kind of more skinny. Yeah. And there are 1911 grip angle versus kind of more of a swept back. Yeah. You could almost compare to a Glock grip angle. Yeah. Uh, A2. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's the old A2s. And then there's, uh, yeah. And you get kinds that are, have like a real big fat palm swell and then Mm -hmm. ones that are way more narrow. Um, that can kind of depend on hand size probably mm-hmm. or just how you like to drive the gun. I know mm-hmm. that my hands can physically fit around like a larger grip, but I just don't like how, I don't know, I feel like I don't have enough control over the gun sure. for what I want to do. I think um, a lot of times some of these preference things like a grip or a stock, um, they can be overstated. Yep, They're important, and if you're building a gun, build what you like. But it's also one of those things where we've been uh, at a shoot, you know, a match or shooting prairie dogs and something happens to your gun and you're like oh let me borrow yours and so you grab somebody else's gun to, with their preferences and you're like oh i can still kill the coyote technically yeah, yeah. Oh, it still, still works work. i guess i still shot the stage i remember a specific match that my rifle just wasn't functioning for some reason or other and um adam borrowed me his like 10 years ago and i shot the match with his rifle and he's a lefty and we're different people and like i still shot the match just fine Nice. It's kind of like it's kind of like driving somebody else's car, you know. Like if you're just gonna move it out of the way, do you need to adjust all the mirrors and everything? No, you can drive it. But if you were gonna go on a five hour road trip, yeah, I'd, I'd probably move the seat to where I want to be. That's yeah. a good analogy. That was that was excellent. So yeah, so yeah like do I a mean, better car analogy than mine. Green. I just classic one upper. I'm just trying to be cool. <laughs> um, but like I mean, on the grips, like again, you know. There's the mill spec, the mill standard, and then I think the commercial aspect of ARs has evolved to the point where, I mean, Magpul is the 800-pound gorilla in that area. Well, that's standard equipment on a lot of guns now. Where like on your budget AR, you're gonna get you're gonna get the full A2, you yeah. know, designed for the really, old chicken wing style. Yeah, shooting. the really the really angled one. 
Whereas like now a lot, you know, that and that's some of what you pay for on the bigger one. Like you're gonna or the the higher dollar guns, you're gonna get better grips. So to some extent, some of that stuff has been standardized already. So a lot even talking about a lot of people might not even experience that because you know their their yeah. gun already comes with an upgraded stock. Yeah. It already comes with a with a grip. So yeah. And you've got you guys mentioned the trigger thing. And again, that's like if we try to I feel like if we try to go down the rabbit hole of talking about triggers, like we would never be able to recommend like get this trigger because right. again, like you said, it's like there's some personal preference, but then it's also like if it costs more than one hundred and fifty dollars, it? it's probably good. So, like, okay, triggers are like the more money you spend, the better they get. Would you say, or is, is there ever like a threshold they get where you're like, okay, now you're just spending money to spend money? Uh, I mean, the players, all the players in that arena, that's where they've priced their product. Yeah, and mm-hmm. the the other thing too with parts in general, triggers, bolt carrier groups, hand guards, if you're building your first AR or any AR and you see something that no one's using and that you've never heard anybody talk about um, buy that thing you're running you're running a little bit of a risk That's what of I like it. That's what I always okay say. if like there's if like the we'll new guy if the new guy's part is like half the cost okay that's less of a risk but if you see somebody and you're like i've never seen anybody use one of these i'm going to buy one and it's the same cost as the one that everybody else uses um, you're going to run significant risk being the guinea pig yeah. I mean, that's just how it is. I've been burned more times than not being like, ooh, I'm going to show up to the match using this part that I've never seen anybody use before. Everybody's going to think I'm pretty awesome. But I'm, a, it doesn't work I'm an and innovator. Awesome. Yeah, I'm a game changer. Nope. I was a sucker. <laughs> how about um, you mentioned in their bolt carrier group, because mm-hmm. now we're sticking with stuff that's inside the receivers. Mm-hmm. Bolt carrier group. Now, now. Into good stuff. Can I say yeah. one thing before we go Please to that? do. Lower parts kit and an upper parts kit. If you oh, bought yeah. stripped uppers and stripped lowers, you're going to need parts kits. That's fair. I firmly believe that's something you don't have to spend a ton of, ton of money on if you're just getting a standard forged receiver set uh, and you need to buy a lower parts kit or an upper parts kit. We're talking the springs. We're talking roll pins, pins springs. The detents. Mm-hmm. Things that you really don't interact with as much, but they hold something important in place. Um, there's probably not a huge difference between buying a Gucci black nitrided roll pin versus a stainless roll pin that, you know, can do the job just as well. Some of that is marketing Mm because there's only a couple places in, in the world that make those parts. Right. And they sell them to everybody. Everybody's using the same roll pins. Everybody's using the same detents. And they're not exactly the most complex thing yeah you're you not going to sweep your selector and be like man i'm glad i got the premium detent you can really <laughs> you can really f- i'm glad i paid another 10 bucks for that yeah, yeah. nope um okay okay that's a good point though i'm glad you brought that up uh for okay old care group now here's one where there are a number of different options there's different uh coatings you can get there's you can go as far as Weights. getting the yeah weighted um oh sure even even the opposite of weighted, super lightweight ones. Um, and there's, you know, full auto, and there's, I think, are there, pretty much all of them. Is there a VCG in here somewhere? Probably. Here, I'll look around while you it guys talk about it. I think I box. ordered it. I think I so, ordered it during this this run. During that run? So yeah, when we talk, when we talk about, about bolt carriers, all right, first understand this. Like, yeah, the military yeah. did way more research on this than you ever will. I, th- so, I think there's some fragile pieces in here. So they so just they kind of arrived at this for a reason. Ooh, that's a, oh that's nice, a hot one. good choice, Mark. Told I think, you I maybe. It. Who knows? Well done. You you don't know how good of a friend he is for you. This is so I so a lot of these parts though. It's okay, Mark. Mark, that's a fancy looking BC. It looks that's light. Like that? It looks super light. Oh my wow. god, that's I like that. light it's things. How so? That's as skeletonized as they come. It might even be a lightweight. So you guys, I don't know carrier. if you guys know this. <laughs> I know you guys know a lot about ARs, but so a lot of these parts that I needed to like finish up and a few extras that I got. Um, I went to uh, Brownells. You just get them there. Yeah, they have this Mark, cool. Like, everyone knew thing. that. They yeah, they had them all. <laughs> Everything I needed. Yeah, everyone always knew that. They even have like a thing that shows you what it'll <laughs> look like, like a builder. They're like, oh, this is what you're going to look like. Here's how you buy all these parts. Well, if anybody, you know, did have the question, which they didn't, but uh, yeah. So Thanks, a lot Mark. of these things right here from Thanks, there. Mark. 
so you bring so much for to the table. vast majority of applications of ARs, there is no reason to deviate from a fairly standard bolt carrier. Okay. It doesn't mean you're less of a man. But there are applications for other things. This one is an extremely lightweight bolt carrier. So now we're getting into like race car parts. Okay. So yes. in the world of three gun, we're really trying to dial in recoil impulse, like to the minutia. You know, we've okay. we've selected we've selected a specific ammo that we're gonna shoot. And we're trying to tune the gas system to give this bolt carrier just enough that it goes all the way back, but that it doesn't bottom out into a into a pulse that we can feel. When that whole thing gets all the way to the end and bottoms out in the tube, that's part of recoil that you can feel. Okay. So as we're dialing out recoil, we're trying to give this just enough so that it goes the full stroke and then goes forward. And this is what people talk about when they're talking about tuning their That's rifle. That's mm-hmm. tuning. But if you're not playing that game... You can get, you can get, there's problems that come with that too. Yeah. If you're not going to shoot the same kind of ammo all the time, that can be a problem for you. But when people start to reduce mass on bolt carriers, that's what they're going for. They're going for that reduced recoil impulse because we're re- reducing the amount of mass that's going back and forth, which is what we feel as recoil in addition to the bullet coming out the end. Um, and then the other thing in bolt carriers is uh, you mentioned full auto carriers. So yes. mil spec carriers um for for a gun to be full auto the quick the quick and dirty on it there's a mechanism in there that they have to put in it takes a third pin so when people joke about the third pin they're talking about an auto sear there's basically an additional mechanism inside inside the lower it goes right here and essentially it's a second trigger so while you have your trigger pulled down it holds the hammer back until the bolt carrier until it goes into battery. Until and it locks. goes all the way into battery and locks, so the the cartridge is safely in the chamber, and then it lets the hammer go. Yeah, and you don't. So and the reason is that you don't want to have that hammer follow as yeah. the carrier goes forward, having the hammer follow. Mm-hmm. Aside from yep. it not being in battery, you also want it so that um, you have enough energy in your hammer to actually yeah. right yeah you might yeah. not you don't actually want your hammer to the ride the ha- ride the bolt all the yep. way down yeah. but the like there's the the conception that we'll just file out the thing that catches the hammer and then we'll have full auto that's not how that works so a full auto carrier just means that it has the little tab i think this might even be a full auto carrier but it has the little tab on the bolt carrier that will trip the auto sear okay in the clinton era when we had the assault weapons ban uh, one of the deals with the devil that some of the companies in the industry did was they made carriers that would not be compatible with an auto sear so that this dimension of the receiver is different. On lightweight carriers, that's some of the first weight that they cut off is is okay, the right. piece of the bolt carrier that does that. Um, so when you talk about a full auto carrier, that's what they're talking about is that it has this aspect down here. And if you're not, if you're not shooting full auto guns, it really does doesn't okay so it's not like a it's not like a suppressor where they say it's full auto rated and it's almost some indication that like it's tougher no nope. something nope. It's nothing just to do with it nope it's, it just has okay. the material that would interact with an auto sear if you had one and so like if Which you're a cloner if you're a cloner like we've had the mark 18 the mark 12 on here before like to those guys it's not cool if it's not all correct correct so yeah. for it to be correct yes it would have a full auto carrier in it would the average 90% person un- feel the difference between a full auto carrier and a semi auto carrier? No, not at all. Hmm. Okay. And then you get into other specialized stuff, like you talk about suppressed stuff. Um, the most common one recently would be the Surefire carrier. They put like extra mass on it. So they, they, they went have the like, opposite. They went heavier. They had heavier, but they also like it moves similar to a buffer weight. Hmm. And that's, that's manipulating the gun when it's shooting a heavy diet of suppressed. Or full auto. Um, we haven't talked about buffers yet, but most of the variances in buffer weights for AR-15s come out of solutions they needed that really only present themselves in full auto. Uh, like they talk about bolt oh. bounce. So the bolt oh, is sure. cycling so fast that it's trying it it tries to fire it it bounces. So it's going so fast that when it chambers it bounces a little bit and then yep. settles. Well, if it tries to ignite the cartridge on the bounce that causes malfunctions and issues. 
Yeah, because so, it's not fully sealed up against the rear of the cartridge. Correct. So mm-hmm. there's correct. some so, space there. So H2, H3, all of that came out of problems they were having with M16s and M4s in full auto. Hmm. Now, can people shoot as fast as full auto and semi-auto? Yeah, you can if you practice, but you're not going to be able to sustainably do it long enough that it's going to be a problem, again, for 95% of people. So people do mess around with bolt weights, buffer weights, things like that, trying to dial in recoil impulse. But really, if you stick with the standard, you're not you're not going to get into any... You're not going to go down a rabbit hole if you don't veer too far from the normal path. Mm-hmm. But gotcha. you can if you put like some really obscure bolt carrier mass with some really obscure buffer weight that you could get that system out of time for sure. Um, but... Now you brought that up happened to me. I know shooting. I into, oh, sorry, Jim. What? No, you go. I was going to say you brought up shooting suppressed. If a person plans on shooting suppressed a lot, are there some considerations they need to make when selecting different parts because mm-hmm. things might be different? Some, and that would be that would be more of an experience thing. I mean, it would it would just make it more pleasant most of the time. So okay. you're going to get more back pressure into the gun than it. W- most guns are set up to shoot unsuppressed. Like from the factory, like this gun right now, this right here, this is set up for unsuppressed. So if all of a sudden we thread a suppressor on here, we're going to change the dynamics of this. So desirable things, if you're going to shoot a lot of suppressed, people tend to want to use adjustable gas blocks Mm -hmm. so they can dial how much gas is coming back in. And then they are dialing in on the buffer weight too, so that there's a little bit on the springs to make it go forward, to, to absorb more of that energy and then make sure it seats. Okay. When it becomes very fouled, which is what they do. Um, but uh, I guess my main point with, with the bolt carriers and the buffer weights and things like that is is people, uh, a lot of times, especially some of those specialized ones, people are like, well, why would, why would Surefire charge that much money for a bolt carrier group? That's absurd. Well, they, Surefire's not stupid. They developed that for a very specific government customer who had a very specific application. And if they can sell a few on the commercial market, cool. Gotcha. But like you know, it's it's just, it's probably not for you. Yeah, is, is on a lot of that specialized stuff. So yeah, don't buy fair. it. You know, unless it's cool for, for you. For buffer weights, though, that was one thing that I got caught up in a lot. I know because I was trying to like, I was like, oh man, you can start dialing in a bunch of stuff with different mm-hmm. buffer weights. Mm-hmm. And then I I remember that I got burned on my nine mil SBR. When I tried messing around with all these different buffer weights, because yeah. I was like, "Well, with a pistol, ca- pistol caliber, you're gonna need a way heavier buffer." I literally got, <laughs> I got the heaviest buffer that exists. I think, I won't say where I got it, but it was a really comically, uh, intuitive name of a website for finding very, very heavy buffer weights. Anyway, and it wasn't even their fault because it's just like I was an idiot. I mean, they have it for some reason, but I just got it because I thought I needed it. And uh, then I was like, then I was like, it, nothing was working. It kept malfunctioning. And then I got a different buffer weight that wasn't quite as heavy, but it was still mega heavy. And finally, I just gave up and I s- decided to spend the money. And I got a JP Silent Captured Spring that's specifically it said nine millimeter on it. And I was mm. like. I was like, I just think it's the gun's problem. I don't know if this expensive buffer is going to help it. I put that in; it runs like a top. That that is one system. Like departing from mil spec, that that captured buffer system is legit. It's worth every penny. It's amazing. You can and then you can buy. They have different springs. They have weight combinations that you can change. Don't but tell like, me that I should now. I the shouldn't same, have never known that. The same. The one that it comes with. That's the one you want. Yeah. But you okay. can you can play with it if you want to. But I mean. It's a plug and play part, and it's it's so amazing. It's yes, yes, you need it. Well, that's that. So, um, where do we go now? Do we go backward or forward to the stock or to the barrel and handguard? Or are we done with stock the and handguard? Okay, stock and handguard. stock and handguard. So we're gonna kind of go okay. both ways, but not quite yep. to the barrel yet. Yep, we kind of talked about, it. but anyway, all right. So stock and handguard. How do you guys feel about this? What what's well are these getting like there's 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 a lot of options here. Yep. In fact, seemingly infinitely many options. Too many. I'll go I'll go out and say too many. Thank you. <laughs> so with a stock, you have to decide a few things. Do you want an adjustable stock? Do you want a fixed stock? If you decide you I don't want know. <laughs> it, yeah, well, do you need to adjust it? I don't know. Okay. You might. All right. 
How do I know if I need to adjust my well, style? Well, I think... Do, do the fixed ones come for only a certain stature person or a certain height person? Or well, like? a fixed stock is going to be exactly that. There's not much adjustability, if any. So, you're... You know, let's just say you're a professional, law enforcement professional, and you need to sometimes be able to shoot your gun with body armor and sometimes without. Oh, okay. Okay? Yeah. That's, an, that's an example where you need to adjust your stock. If you are buying an AR that you want to teach your kids how to shoot, you need to adjust your stock. Yes. It needs to go to a shorter length of pull. That's all there is to it. So decide if you need to adjust your stock, and if you do, then buy an adjustable stock. Within adjustable stocks, you're also going to have things like length of pull and your cheek cheek weld height, your, your yes. cheek riser. Um, at that point, you can look at a multitude of options on the market that all will give you the ability to do that. But what it boils down to is, is it comfortable for you? Do you get a good cheek weld if you need a cheek weld? You know, you may or may not need a cheek weld with a non-magnified optic, you know, something with um, very low parallax error, you know, red dot, holographic, and you may want to have a good cheek weld with something like a magnified optic where you are experiencing some amount of parallax as you get off axis on the optic. That's that's your decision on a stock. You want to spend $50 or $400? You can decide that. We can't decide that for you. Hmm. What do you get when you start spending like $400? Um, you get more robust adjustments. You can get adjustments that can be made quickly um, versus having to use tools. And no wobble. Yep. And you get adjustments that are solid once you've made that adjustment. And then you can get um, you know, you, you can get an adjustable stock with length of pull and cheek weld adjustments for ninety dollars and you can get the the same something version for two hundred and fifty to three hundred and fifty dollars. Um, you'll feel that the more expensive one typically feels more solid. It's more repeatable, and it and it just overall feels like it's a higher quality. I'd say having a nice, yeah, having a nice feel of quality is pretty nice when it's something that's literally going to be resting against your face. Mm-hmm. I, I was gonna say, I mean, <laughs> you know, that sounds like, and even just the way you're describing it, and intuitively, like that's a big part of you talking about interaction, interacting with a part. Like that's a big interaction with your face, with yeah. you know how it's contacting. You know your shoulder pocket, whatever, yeah. or your, your, you know, if you like you said, if you are wearing body armor, it's contact. I mean, golly, people you know. always talk about how stuff feels like the hand of it, you know. And I'm always like, I couldn't care less. My hands are dead anyway. <laughs> but when it's something that's going to be on your face, I'm like, I kind of want that to be nice, you know. Yep. That's that's maybe just me. I don't know. Well, and, and just just length of pull in people's arms. Like everybody's yeah. arms are are different, and so that has a lot to do with the ergonomics of how. A rifle feels now once you find your spot you're probably set so like Ruben and I will buy the $300 stock for our three gun rifles and we'll buy it multiple times over for multiple guns um, but and that's to get the custom fit but even on like carbines when we have the the six position carbine stocks like once you figure out the spot that you like like it's pretty much going to be there all the time um, there's, you know, you may go in and out a little bit, but I think what's more important when you're selecting a carbine style stock is that it doesn't rattle on the tube. That's some of what you pay more for. So how much tolerance is there in the, in the tube? And then, um, and then the, the, you know, again, face feel. So some of them have more, uh, what cheek, um, well, what's the, what's the spreader thing? I don't know the technical term. Mm, spreader. That sounds but. The you know there's stocks there's stocks that are very slim, yeah, and then there's stocks that have more um, more of a cheek pad built out on yeah, them. Yeah, that's and true. how yeah. that feels a, for you a spreader is very. <laughs> I think that's that a, I think that might even be the <laughs> term. It just feels it's possibly, <laughs> but like that's a very personal choice. Yeah, but like when you're picking a stock, I'm more look buying the upper tier ones. You know, and I'll buy upper tier and carbine stocks. We're talking. I don't know what do they got. 70 80 bucks 70 80 bucks instead of 20 bucks yeah for the okay cheap sure. so a person isn't like no you know killing themselves in their no. pocketbook there are no there are no expensive carbine stocks the expensive stocks are the rifle stocks mm-hmm. ones that ones that have the fully adjustable cheeks and all that stuff but if you get one that's the shape that you like and doesn't rattle on the tube 
The one you're holding, what, what is this? These ones go on a rifle buffer tube, don't they? But yes. then they have adjustability, so it's like an adjustable yep. fixed. Yep. So this is essentially what you're paying more for here is you're trying to you're getting the adjustability so that you can you can adjust length of pull on them. Mm -hmm. But when it locks, it's locked. Which one is Very this? Again? This is the, the UBR. Yeah, ah, the, the UBR. That's the right. Magpul UBR. It has some storage functionality. Yeah, it's got, got all your built-in sling stuff. Mm -hmm. um, storage um, I guess that's the other thing you pay for. Do they have yeah. do they have QD cups for slings, swivels, yeah. and things like that? Um, that's an example of an expensive carbine mm -hmm. stock that goes on a rifle buffer tube. Yeah, yeah. and Let it's heavier to get that solid feel. Mm -hmm. It is heavier. Let me uh, okay. This is how a six-pound rifle turns into a nine-pound rifle is stuff like this. Let me ask you this: It's kind of a random one. What's the history behind why there's mil spec buffer tubes and commercial spec buffer tubes? Well, that's back to the uh, the Clinton era. That's a really annoying deal with the thing double. to deal with. Yeah. Um, well, we can pick on Colt at this point. Um, Colt did that, <laughs> and that was a deal that they did with the devil. Um, essentially, again, so that mill guns couldn't end up on the streets, mm. or they couldn't sell. They couldn't sell weapons of war on the streets and then can get converted into... So they were trying to make different parts that wouldn't be compatible with what was being made for no. military and law so enforcement. Because a, a mil-spec stock won't fit on a commercial buffer tube. Right. Yeah. So okay. having the ability for so, a manufacturer yeah. to say, this is the stock that we think civilians should own versus the stock that the military yeah. uses. Mm. Okay. Oh, yeah. No, we don't sell the stuff we sell to the military to civilians. Completely different. Those parts won't play together. Got it. And so they were like, cool, you can stay in business. And they're like, sweet. And how did that work out for them? But that's moving on. on. Moving on. <laughs> but Jeez. yeah, commercial. Anyway. Commercial, commercial stuff that's really, just. Uh, that's, let this go, Adam. That's, and that's, that's residual from the clinic. Same thing with the pins. Uh, there's, you'll see uh, large pin trigger oh, yeah. groups. They drilled out the holes bigger on the receivers, on the commercial receivers, so that mil spec triggers wouldn't work. It just hmm. seems like really gun. just a hassle. Yeah, and for for the most part, the industry's gone away from that. But I mean, don't hassle me, bro. The '90s were they weren't that long ago, but I mean, it was a while ago. <laughs> don't hassle snake. It, it was the '90s. <laughs> no hassle snake. No hassle snake, bro. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> how about uh, do, well while we're on the stocks, there's pistol braces. Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> Do we Hot talk button. about that? I mean, not that we don't want to talk about it because we're nervous, but like it's a can of worms to open up because you got now like, yeah. I mean, what do they just recently try to try to outlaw those stupid things again? Not stupid things, those great things again. They they submitted uh, a revision in the policy for comment, um, and they got a resounding "Don't do that." And so they're like, "Okay, we won't do that for now." They're gonna come back. They. They, they always do. They always do. But this last round, you know, this what we're referring the to difference, in late 2020, that got... Yeah. I'll say this, though. Um, the difference between this round of, hey, don't do that, and the last rounds of, hey, don't do that, is they had um, significant numbers of people that are in Congress sign letters saying that if this becomes an issue, we'll take it up in Congress. If what becomes an issue, sorry. If if you make all of these people felons overnight, oh, we will challenge you in in Congress. I mean, oh, so gotcha. uh, that was a big difference. So I'm not I'm not yeah. saying it won't come back. Yeah, I'm saying it'll probably be a quite a while before it gets that. Or it'll same, come back in probably some different, in a different form. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I mean, it, that's how. Le I mean, law is legislated through the houses of representation and the executive branch, a law enforcement agency by the way our system works, is not allowed to arbitrarily decide what the law is. If they're going to change what the law is, that needs to go through, you know, schoolhouse rock. That's how it works. So when... when 90. When ATF, yeah. when ATF said, we're going to say this, they got a no, but that's the power struggle that's going on politically. Yeah. So um, pistol braces... Pistol braces pistol are... Braces, uh, they're, 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 they're pretty cool. <laughs> they're a yeah. unique way to get a... Firearm AR-15 style with a shorter barrel than 16 inches. Yep. But still with some form of a thing on the back that 
can stabilize. Stabilize the gun. Stabilize hey, the gun. The, the, yes. the definition, contact. current definitions of what a pistol are. What a pistol is? What a pistol are? What a pistol know. is? You said, yeah. And um, this is any pistol. Any pistol. Yeah. Right. Um, they've, a brace is made to make that shooting experience more enjoyable. Yes. And so they do that. They, they, and have they, do. Said, they have said it was okay at some point. And they're having a hard time taking it back, but until they do, I thoroughly it's enjoy shooting my pistol AR with a pistol brace on it. Now, would I enjoy shooting an SBR more? I think I would because it would just be an SBR, and in my brain, I'd be like, "This is an SBR and not a pistol." Yeah. But I also will say that traditional most of the time, shooting a pistol, it's kind of like, man, yeah, yeah, it's it's like okay. Traditionally, I think, I guess a stock, an actual rifle stock technically feels more solid to me. Yeah. And that's probably yeah. what makes a difference. Tell you what, though. Well, even with sweet pistol braces now. And you're going to get some additional adjustability with a system like yep. that. Like if yeah. you had an, you know, an SBR yeah, with an solid. adjustable stock, it gives you some flexibility there. Yeah, right? Absolutely. There's adjustable pistol braces now. Yeah. Oh, okay. But, well, but, but I mean, Mark, welcome. <laughs> so let's Mark, see the invoice Mark on this the box. <laughs> 2015, yeah. Uh, my, yeah. My counter to that is: is uh, does anybody put a pistol brace on a full length rifle? I know not that's very your many. So, Adam. so it's like, well, why? But um, oh, Adam also has a really good point about pistol braces. Okay, and their cost. Oh, um, well, oh. the the <laughs> industry the industry has figured out. Well, why are people why do why do people buy pistol braces? Because they don't want to pay the tax. How much is or the tax? they don't want to wait? Also that. Only about a month, but either way, oh yeah. So e e file on form ones super quick right now, subject to change. But I mean, so the tax is two hundred dollars. How much does an s? How much does a pistol brace cost? A hundred and twenty five, a hundred and fifty. So you're hundred and seventy saving money. there. Hundred and seventy with a buffer tube and a spring. Yeah. So you're paying the same amount of money really. It's just the semantics of it, you know. Mm-hmm. There are some benefits to I to having a pistol. Um being able to travel across state lines legit with your concealed carry permit as opposed to having to file a form twenty for every SBR you own. Legit. Yeah. There's yeah. there's definitely some reasons. hunting opportunities. Hunting opportunities, absolutely. Legit. Yep. Okay. But uh, it almost yeah. like that be- that's um, to my knowledge, though, um, you can always – it depends on how you operate it. So you could potentially take something that was an SBR and operate it as a pistol in in a hunting application. Should we caveat that just in case? Check your regs. Yeah, absolutely. All right, yeah, check, check your, your regs. Reg- check your, check regs. your regulations, however. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right. How about the but, hand – oh, sorry. Well, but at the same time, I mean, pistol braces are a good option – because, I mean, even if people are willing to put in stamps on stuff, you probably aren't willing. I mean, there's still a finite amount of money, right? That you're probably not going to put in several dozen stamps. You yeah. could, theoretically, you, you can just buy pistols. Um, I just transfer. I started a transfer on two SBRs yesterday. They are SBRs, and you have to do the process to take them home. Yeah. So, um where you don't have to do that with a pistol. So the the caveat of the process and the paperwork is the main reason to do yeah. it. I I think also, you know, in there, like, okay, in Wisconsin, or even when I lived in Washington, you know, like Wisconsin, they call it the conservation patron's license, right? I buy that every year. Do I, do I uh, go fishing for sturgeon every year? No, I don't. Have I yet ever? Actually, no, right? So there, there's my example. The heck's but wrong with you? I buy that. So I know, like, unequivocally, I can catch and kill... Anything in the state during its, you know, during with whatever legal method of take, you know, during yeah. that season, right? It's kind of like a safety catch-all, yeah. right? Yeah. And with the, it's with the safe pistol, space. that's my safe space. With the pistol, I feel like there's kind of some parallels. You're like, I know, like, I kind of know the rules that are oh, around, like, a pistol. That's a very and good point. I know that, like, I'm not... As a law-abiding citizen, my goal is to not break laws, right? Mm-hmm. And that's almost like a safety built-in that's less likely that I might like cross a state line or I don't know. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and I don't know. And that's why I don't do it. I sometimes end up at the lake and people ask me if I want to go fishing. I like, oh, I don't have a license. You know, I it's miss the out. worst. It's the worst. Oh, you can get those online now very fast. I, that's what they tell me. Let's go to hand guards. Let's go fishing. In the interest of hand time. Hand guards. In the interest of time. 
Another thing. Oh yeah, we got to this. Too many options. Yes. Everybody, it's unreal. It's everybody unreal. who wants to get into the space, they come out with our handguard. Have you seen our handguard? Uh, Check out our handguard. There, bah, there's so many. So uh, what am I catching here? That it is really important or it's not super important? It's or an it easy, depends? It's an easy part to make that a lot of people have put their own interpretations on. They're mostly the same, but some are definitely better than others. What is a handguard doing? What a handguard is doing, when you shoot the gun, the barrel gets hot. So you don't want to touch that. Started off in mil spec as I love that basically you have this, Mark. Why do you have shield. this? Glacier guards. So it's just a piece of plastic, and there's actually a Why piece of metal you? underneath there. So you're not touching the hot barrel in the hot gas tube. Mark From said he was going to get into the cloner game. <laughs> well, you bought the wrong one. <laughs> 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 um but from here, where folks went is this is not free floated. So when you put this on a receiver and you actually hold on to it and you put some like pressure on it, or if you start you know, wrapping a sling or something, you can start to contort this barrel off of its point of gotcha, off of its zeroed spot. I'm gonna ask you a question right now though. Mm-hmm. Are any AR barrels free floated? Truly? Yes. They got a gas block on them. Is that not free floating? Is that it's, is it's, that still it's, free it's floating? floating too? Oh, the tube, yeah, the tube's floating. Yeah, the tube's floating. So it's it's okay. And I'll I'll say this: I've I've watched like many times at matches, someone come up and brace off of a, a barricade, and on a hundred yard target, we're talking you know a four inch or a five inch target, the deflection they put on that handguard by resting it on on a barricade was enough to shoot. Over the top every Talking time. Talking about just, a handguard that isn't free floated. So yep. th- yeah, just okay. Just or resting the barrel. Or, past or the oh, guard. sure, yeah. That, Man, you see enough. guys do that sometimes, and it's like, golly, hmm. like you know, in hunting situations, they're in a box blind or something like that, and you know, rest that barrel. And, oh. mm-hmm. Yep, every time. So handguards got into this world of like, hey, well, now we're just... free floated. Okay. So they free floated it. You're not getting that charging handle back, Mark. Yes. Um. So free floated handguards is kind of where okay. the world caught on fire. And then that comes to a matter of um, how do they attach it? That's probably the most important part that nobody looks at. The, the actual barrel nut. the actual barrel nut and the interface with the barrel nut is really what separates the expensive ones from the cheap ones. And then um, and then a lot of it is hand feel. So how you know how how big in circumference is it? So how does it feel in your hand to hold on to? They started off. They were basically what two inch tubes. Two yeah, inch extrusions, um, or there, there's Picatinny rails. So they had, they call them quad rails. There was Picatinny on all four sides. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that was your, you can interface with it wherever you want. And then people had to put all, or put, it would put all the covers on them so that they they wouldn't cheese grate their hand. Then somebody got the idea. Well, let's make an interface system where we can attach the Picatinny where we want it, but then we have a slick rail where we don't want it. And that's kind of currently where we're at. Mm-hmm. That started off as everybody had their proprietary kind. I mean, you had JP basically had threaded holes throughout the whole thing. Um, Troy, I think, was one of the first ones that came out with the real, like, you can, it was real modular where it had holes in it, and then they had a rail that would interface with that hole that, with, like, a backer. Hmm. Oh, yeah, I remember the Detroit. Yeah, those things. ones yeah. look kind of neat. They're like honeycomb looking almost. Yep, yep. And then the mil- I think it was the military was like, that's pretty cool. What if you came up with a, like a like a more standardized system for that? And then uh, Noveski and somebody else started working on what became Key Mod. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then um, I think... Key Mod's like the pallet racking out in the warehouse it is exactly little, like that oh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. a little dimple yeah so there's a big the big hole in the back you slide it forward and then it, you tighten down on the little part yep yeah um and then it's, it's magpul right yeah magpul came out with theirs they called it mlock they were a little bit later to the game but they were like that's a good idea but we want to do it different yep and they did and then there was a military trial on because the military wanted this. They were coming out of their Block 2 handguards with uh, the wrist 2 from Daniel Defense, which was a very stout quad rail. And so they're like, we're mm. trying to shave some weight off this gun, so we want a modular rail. Which system are we going to select? They ran a trial. I believe it was Crane that ran a trial. And they did like the, they tried to 
pry them off and tried to would shear they hold zero them. shear them smash them and they're both good but at the end of the day only one got to win they picked mlock well when the military standardizes on something that's pretty much what the rest of the industry is going to standardize so that's for the most part why keep there was a time what was it three years ago key mod was everywhere Mm-hmm. Everybody had you weren't Everybody cool if you mod. didn't have key mod. I still have some key mod. Okay. I still have some key mod too. I'm gonna throw out there. I wish key mod would have won. I I do as well. Key I'm a key mod guy. Better in my opinion. But when they stand like overnight, you know, companies that only offered one, you know, they were only offering key mod. They redid all their handguards. Now they're all M lock. Yeah. Um, for the so consumer that's... though, that standardization. I mean, there's so many accessories for oh, ARs, it's great. right? I was gonna say that that great. sounds like that's a big benefit. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, because you know, you don't run into a wall. This this rails key mod, but I have an M lock adapter. You know, for the accessory companies for flashlights and hand stops and all that stuff, it's awesome. Um, yeah. So, barrel mm-hmm. nut interface. Um, How about length? Do you like to have your handguard run all the way out near the end of the barrel, or is there I a do. specific you do? I do. Regardless of the barrel length. Y- yes. Okay. And that's mainly for bracing on stuff. So, like, you know, it gives you more oh, room yeah, more room to interact with, with a prop or a, okay. or a barricade to get stable. Oh, sure. You're like, you were just talking about not wanting to rest your barrel mm-hmm. on something. That makes sense. Yep. So, you know, that one, well, that one, there's no safe spot to brace on. But, like, you know, if, if it only comes, you know, to that M4 length, you got to stick that barrel all the way through to get to the rail. Good point. Um, So, it gives you more options. And then... Uh, now it's really popular because of just the amount of real estate to attach things. You oh, know, sure. people want to put their hand on it. They want to attach a flashlight. They want to attach a sling, a, a laser, sling attachment, laser, lasers, tape switches. Tape switches. So the more chainsaws, yeah, the throwers. more Ooh. real estate you have, the more options you have to get all that stuff on board and then still have a ergonomic place to put your hand. Okay, um, and then. Um, how big they are. So the bigger ones tend not to heat up as fast. The The slim rails got oh. really popular really fast. Yeah. Well, the closer it is to the barrel, the more of a heat sink it's going to be. So Which it'll, is the closer your hand is to the heat. Yeah, so it's cool like to the touch for a while, but if you dump two mags through it pretty fast, it's going to start to warm up. So bigger, thicker hand guards don't warm up as fast. Yeah. And then, like Ruben's talking about with the lasers, you start talking about night vision and things like that, or reasons why the military selected certain rails. Well, they're attaching aiming devices out on the handguard, mm-hmm. and that can start to, if there's flex in here, that can start to wander oh, like zeros. POI. Yeah, exactly. Shift or whatever. Yep. Yeah, yeah. if they're so, aiming with a IR or a visible laser, yeah. and that starts to move, I mean, you're mm-hmm. just, you lost zero. Yeah. 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 So when you look at like, um, well, when the military picked the the Geisley rail, why did they pick that one? It came down to their interface and how it would hold zero and still give them the modularity that they wanted. I mean, it makes a hundred. Not that I've attached the laser to anything, right? But and it makes a hundred percent sense. But like, yeah, that's if you not something that crossed my mind, like, right. oh, that better stay put. Yeah. If you don't have a laser, who cares? You know. I mean, free float, free float, ugh, free float rail is a free float rail if you're not attaching anything to it, and then save the weight. Mm-hmm. You know, um, but when you start to have those applications, that's where that's where when when folks start to wonder, well, why this, why that? Well, it probably has an application for somebody. It just might not be you, and what you're doing with it. So that's fair. Now the barrel and muzzle device underneath your handguard. Yes. Forend, um, this is we had some we talked about this a little bit earlier, but. So, it's a wear item, mm-hmm. not the muzzle device, really, right? Depending on how short your barrel is. Oh, okay. And why? Uh, so, shorter barrels, uh, especially muzzle brakes, muzzle brakes are actually trying to mitigate recoil, so they are mm-hmm. catching the gas and directing it. Sure. Well, if you're putting that muzzle brake at the end of a longer barrel, like a 16, 18, 20-inch barrel, where the powder is mostly burned up, the amount of flash and well, the amount of pressure and unburnt powder that hits that baffle. Yeah, it acts as a basically as a sandblaster. Yeah, like sandblasting it is that's on a yeah. shorter. Yeah, shorter. Uh, gun. The shorter yeah. it gets, the more unburnt powder. The higher the pressure is, the more heat there is. Um, so you can, you you theoretically can shoot out a muzzle brake 
on shorter guns. Now, so like I have I have muzzle brakes that are visibly eroding, uh, like a crater, like a crater around the uh, the orifice that the bullet goes through. Okay. At the same time, that's uh, the one in particular, the the barrel that I shot out on a gun that I shot, you know, full seasons of three gun and all the practice and everything associated with them for three four years. It has noticeable degradation, but it's not. You can't feel it yet. Mm-hmm. But hmm. but that that muzzle brake is on the path to someday it's going to wear out. And it's going to wear out sooner than if it was on an 18-inch barrel where it was getting hit with a lot less pressure and a lot less unburnt powder that, that was abrading yeah. material. Jim, whatever you muzzle device you have on that one AR of yours, I'm pretty sure it wore out after uh, after the first <laughs> shot. That thing... That thing, it's bad. It's blinding. Um, and hot. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, speaking of things wearing out and how you know tough they are under all this stuff, so I, I know we'll go back to the barrels. And uh, how about different materials of barrel? Um, we have you got uh, you've got stainless barrels. You have regular steel barrels that are nitrided. You have chrome lined barrels. Um, and then obviously the two there's like forged barrels, um, carbon wrapped barrels, carbon wrapped barrels. Mm. What um, what do you guys so think around that sort of thing? First decide. I would say there's two categories, two big categories of AR barrels. Okay. There's there's heavy use barrels. Yeah. That's your that's your um uh hammer hammer forged like hammer forged cromali or something. That's your hammer forged barrel meant to take a lot of heat, meant for a long service life. Um this not meant necessarily for accuracy. Right. Okay. Picture your typical military barrel. Okay, they're going to put it in a gun, it's going to go the distance, it's going to get thrown away. Um, Then there's precision barrels. So they're made out of softer materials, machined a little bit more precisely, but under extreme heat, they will lose what is magic about them. Sure. Hmm. Is that an... That's an oversimplification, but... Yeah, I I think you a lot of times... When you're talking about accuracy within barrels, you're talking a stainless barrel. Yes, okay. that's I've heard um, that a lot. So, and, and the type of rifling that it has, uh, how the how the rifling is lapped, kind of the finish quality of the rifling and the in the inner diameter of the barrel, um, and how that's kept in tolerance versus a barrel that's lined with something that uh, you know, like a a chrome lined barrel or a chromoly barrel. Um, or something that's nitrided, looking for more service life, but Got less it. accuracy. Okay. Um, mm. Chrome specifically, because that's going to get asked about a lot. That's a military specification. Uh, most of the reason that exists goes back to the politics of the U.S. Army in the 1950s. Um, oh, everybody loved chrome back in the 50s. Well, long story short, um, the U.S. Ordnance Corps wasn't super excited about the AR-15 getting adopted. Right. So it was mostly sabotaged. Uh, for those who want to dig into it, no the uh, the uh, the hearings of 1968, you can read all about it. But basically, they issued M-16s into a subterranean jungle environment without cleaning kits, and surprise, surprise, they rusted and didn't work out super hot. And they changed the propellant in a gas-operated gun, and so the ammo didn't work super hot. So in all of the revisions, like, you know, when, when the heads rolled on all that stuff and, well, what has to change on this um, to present, prevent corrosion in the barrel with the technology of the time, they said, okay, henceforth, all barrels must be chrome-lined. The chrome would, um, would increase the service life and corrosion resistance of those barrels. That's this, along the lines of where the, the forward assist came from. A.R. Stoner sure. never d- developed the forward assist the army said it had to be there and he said that's stupid and they said yeah we don't care put it on there and it's on there 50 years later people are like well it's on there it has to be on there no it goes way back to then um so chrome chrome line is around because that specification came out of those hearings in 1968 (laughs) specifically for issuing the m16 around the vietnam war is it ap- as applicable today for for the materials that they're making barrels out of now? 
I mean, the materials have changed quite a bit. So right. um, I don't think it's as big a deal now as it used to be. But when it gets asked about, that's where it's getting asked about because it is a military specification. So people are curious about that. Seems like there's that's a lot of really good stories intertwined with that whole thing, oh, Adam. So many. So many. Share hmm. some links when we get back to the desk. <laughs> <laughs> Got to read so about many. that. <laughs> the AR, I've got a lot of questions right I'm, now, and but I'm, I'm really little, not, I'm not I'm too ask lazy them, to research it, but I would read yeah. it if you sent it to me. Yeah. The AR <laughs> shout, really out, shout out to Small Arm Solutions on YouTube. He uh, covers it at length, and it's actually interesting. So Really Copy very that. interesting story behind these guns, just all around. Um, from being from being quite disliked to now being the oh man, America, oh yeah, America's to, rifle, well, yeah, right. America's rifle, and I guess still disliked by well, some. Hey, the U.S. <laughs> U.S. Ordnance Corps isn't around anymore. They messed up. Is that like your mic, Burn. Is that like your mic drop moment. <laughs> Burn. Yeah. Um, what else on barrels? Uh, the other thing on barrels that gets talked about a lot is uh gas system, okay. gas system length. Um, so there's. Oh. So that refers to where on the barrel do they actually drill the gas port that they put the gas block over. And that influences uh, how much pressure hits the gas system. Sure. So there are different lengths to go with different barrels you and different applications. For the Don't most part, there it. is, they've been standardized ish into pistol length, which is super short. Very. For like your seven inch barrels. There's carbine, which is the standard M4 profile, um, and it's probably the most common, I would say, right now. There's rifle length, which is uh, the M16 length, the full 20-inch barrel length, or in shorter barrels. When they say rifle length, they're taking that same length gas system. They're just chopping the barrel shorter, so there's a shorter dwell time um, between the gas port and the, the muzzle. And then what's popular right now is what's called mid-length. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there's enough commercial demand for these people demanding um, performance out of the guns. And when Ruben was talking about these manufacturers that are kind of doing their homework and honing in on these, they've, they've shocker, arrived at some intermediate length that wasn't standardized by the military because we're using links that aren't standardized by the military anymore a lot of times. Um, is so that like the medium height ring of gas tubes? Yes. Okay. Pretty much works yes. for most things. Most things, most of the time. It's mostly standardized. Some companies have their own, though. Uh, Knight's Armament would be an example of that. Knight's, Knight's gas system requires Knight's parts. Um, but on the, other, on the other end of the spectrum, most people's mid-length stuff will, you know, most mid-length tubes will work with most mid-length barrels yeah but you got to do your research on that um but length of gas system that's manipulating how much pressure hits hits your hits your bolt carrier group and that translates very much into um uh, cyclic reliability of the gun and then what the recoil impulse is going to feel like because the pressure of the barrel internally is very different at these different points and it varies barrel length to barrel length so a mid-length or a carbine length 18-inch barrel is going to feel very different than a carbine length 12-inch barrel, mm -hmm. right? Because the pressures are just way different. Okay. Um, but that has a big a big influence on what your gun's going to feel like when it shoots. Is where where what size gas system they put in there? Yeah, I feel like people these days love the mid-length 16 to 14 and a half inch gun mm -hmm. and. Like a rifle you know. length, sixteen or eighteen. Yeah, and then yep. would you say when they go to like an eleven and a half or a ten and a half gun, that's a carbine length, or is that yeah. a okay carbine yeah. pistol length? You can, pistol yeah, so length. you can still do mid, kind of. Pistol length typically um, is only used typically in like seven and a half inch two twenty threes or like nine to ten inch three hundred blackouts. Okay. Yeah, but like you get into some, you, like an obscure thing that a lot of people that that's trying. People are trying to make happen because they think it's cool, but the manufacturer is like, no, it's not cool because we have to warranty that. Um, is like, what is it? Is it when they try to put mid length on like a 12 inch barrel? Mm -hmm. So it's so a 12 inch barrel with a mid length gas system. So there's sh super short dwell time between when the gas hits the port and when the bullet exits the muzzle and the pressure drops. Yeah. 
And that depends, too, if you're shooting suppressed or not. Yep. However, if you're trying to make a gun that's going to function with or without a suppressor, typically it, at least, like, two inches of of dwell time or two inches mm-hmm. of barrel past your gas journal is ne- almost necessary. It, it can work, but that's one of those things where it's like, yes, you could you could configure a rifle that way. It It doesn't always work out awesome. And then that's one of those things where it's like, well, if you're that person who has decided, yes, I want, I'm just using this as an example, but I want 12-inch mid-length gas system. And then you're out there on the internet looking for one, and every AR company that you go to doesn't make one. They're like, oh, man, I was hoping they would make one. Okay, well, I'll try this company. Oh, they're not making one. They've tried it, but if they make it, they have to warranty it. So that's kind of one of those things where they're saying, well, that's, where you might catch yourself and like, well, if nobody makes this thing that I think is awesome, why why is that? That's kind of one of those. I mean, like, that seems yeah. like it's like could be done, what? but it's just not. I'm looking for a square wheel. Yeah, <laughs> I think that'd work better. Oh wait, nobody makes one. That's that's one of those. So that's when cancel you, wheel companies. <laughs> when the companies that want to make ARs aren't making it, that's where just ask the question. Doesn't mean necessarily don't do it, but there's probably a reason that. Right, that it's not yep. common. We have two rifles uh, that we have, two SBRs um, in the training program that are suppressor specific. They have a very short gas system or a, a long gas system for a 12 and a half inch barrel. Uh, and with a suppressor, they're phenomenal. Hmm. Without mm-hmm. hit or miss. Yeah. Interesting. With hot ammo, probably also yeah, awesome. With, with lower pressure ammo, interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Well, you bought a good charging handle. Great charging handle, Mark. I feel like we'd be remiss to, to not talk about optics, but we will say that we actually did record an episode that was all about optics on an AR-15, so you can go check that out. We'll put we'll put a link to that as well. But um, do have to plug though, since we are talking about optics, uh, AR, specific. ARs and optics that are really good, specific to them. Some new stuff out there you might want to check out would be that new Spark Solar and the Spitfire yes. HD Gen Twos, which are super sweet. On top of those. Mark, you actually have some MC Ryan is playing oh, them. Are I we think. doing last calls plant. today? Can I have yeah, one? We can do uh we can do yeah. We'll do last calls, Ruben, just for you. Here's this here's the Spitfires. We'll send them up here. Those things are sweet. Three X and a five X. Oh, I love the five X with a red dot on top. I just think that's so be the versatile. Thing. I'm all about that solar life. I am yeah, that's I'm, solar. I am so digging that right now. One so uh cool. my last call right, is that if you decide to build an AR um, This is gonna be a it might be a shot. If you decide to build an AR, just remember, you're building a gun, and you are a gunsmith in the same way that you're a chef when you put the Pop-Tart in the toaster. <laughs> <laughs> but, Ruben, I have a Dremel. <laughs> oh. I am you are yeah, a gunsmith. gunsmith. Your Dremel I is the captain, pouring yeah. the stuff on top of your toaster your strudel. Toaster strudel. <laughs> That's what it is to you being a gunsmith. Oh, uh, that's the syrup to your waffle. <laughs> Delicious. Very much so. All right. That's a good last call. <laughs> Thanks for that. How long have you been stewing on that? Since the first like two minutes. That's I why like I didn't that. talk oh, that's much. Hard. I like that. I didn't that's forget hard. it. Um we'll save Adam for last. My last call? Yeah. Apparently it's a Wisconsin thing to say start with me last when you're at a restaurant. Last. Okay. And they say, well, what will we be having? You say, start with me last. Is that okay. a supper club thing? Start. I, I think it start is. Start with me last. Come here once. That's definitely a Wisconsin thing. Mm-hmm. All right. My last call. Uh, you uh, you guys know how to put this stuff together? Yeah. It's more of a question. It's last call my, question. My last call is we've, we've gone this whole time without really actually addressing the fact that it seems like it's really happening here. And Mark... You have some legit cool parts. What is that you, side charge? You have about why the heck would I not? You have about three guns. You bought, yeah, you did. How many lowers do we have Pass here? Me that oh, things got here. a little crazy. Okay, how many, that. how many lowers did you buy? Here's another lower that the government knows about. Mark, no, okay, actually, they do know about all of them. What? What? Um, this is like a. This is like a easy. Okay, Mark. Here. So here's. I just completed your Jim, upper. Did you, did you just Scott you Parks? Did you? <laughs> my Lord. You just Scott Parks my brand new thing. I just shot. I did the same thing, Adam. No, here let me see this, and I'm gonna all the springs will go back. out, and I'll hand it back to you broken. There you go. <laughs> the Enjoy. Springs did come oh, out. Yes. I shot the bolt, 
springs out the back or like, whatever. Like I said, this has I've been a process. Like we've made before. some we've made some decisions along the way. I may Who's actually me? have a few extra me and Ruben and suggestions from Ryan Muck and her. There, no there I just built works, Mark's you know? upper. I should have built his other upper. Wait, hold on. No, you're putting things together too fast. No one told me that this oh, was happening. You this don't is have, there's a plan. There's a I method to I hope you didn't have your heart set on that, Mark, because I don't right. think you're getting that one back. Everybody, we got a lot of stuff here. Things are getting crazy. Things are getting put together. I don't even know how. Things are falling apart. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Adam, Ruben, thanks Stuck. for all the information. Bye, everybody. Wait, no, not bye. Mark. This is a huge I, deal. No. Not by. This is a huge deal. <laughs> Would how many you gun, can we just quit, say how many guns I, you're going to build? Time out. Would you quit putting everything together? Hey, I, I ordered this for me on is that, that order. Is that titanium nitride? That is titanium, or is that nickel boron? What is that? Oh, that's a titanium that's nitride, titanium so nitride hot. bolt. You have so a titanium right nitride bolt carrier? Naturally, Jim. Mark, you know I like the finer things This is a full auto life. one, Mark. Gosh. Don't say that. Mark, you have... These are all full auto? Guys, full everybody, uh, Mark. Cool it. I messed this thing up. No, 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 no. No, this no, is no, mine. No, 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 no. Look at this. Your muzzle brake's already. Oh, going look, on. Mark. Another uh, a gas block and a I know. hundred and fifty dollar charging you handle. You never lubricate or oil anything. Why do you get these? Why do you have these little bottles? Mark's ner- even genuinely oil, nervous even about people knowing what he has. Upper me, bro. Mark hates so when correct. people touch his stuff. But this also, these are sunglasses, Mark. <laughs> yeah, I need those. Hey, that's, those not, are, that's not the AR part. Mind. I unbroke it. Jim, stop it. I can't. You can't, fi- it. You can't talk to him it. like that. I'm fixing yes, it. Yes, I can't. You're not fixing it. You've broken it three times in a row. I can't wait I wouldn't mind learning to see it. this happen. I, Everybody stay tuned for Mark's AR. I, I know you Mark, guys you did your last call. Oh, sorry, Adam, together, we skipped you. But <laughs> oh, you did your last call already. No, you said that that one organization is no longer around. Oh, is that it? Yeah, that counts. Canceled. Bye. (laughs) There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.